EBM, EBP, EIP, what's the difference? This is video one of the Cultivating Curiosity module. The following slides will advance on their own, but feel free to pause and rewind as many times as you need. We are at step zero of the seven step evidence-based practice process. And that step is all about cultivating curiosity and creating a culture of evidence. You'll learn more about what that means and about what this whole process means as you watch this video. In video one, you're going to learn about evidence-based medicine, evidence-based practice, and evidence-informed practice so that you can begin to understand how they differ from each other and how they are similar. Knowing about these different models will be helpful to you, as you may encounter any of these in the course of your studies and your work. You may also encounter different models of evidence-based practice. At McGill, we use a seven-step model, which was developed by and for nurses. First, let's talk about evidence-based medicine. Evidence-based medicine was first defined by Sackett and colleagues at McMaster University in 1996. They described it as the conscientious, explicit, and judicious use of current best evidence in making decisions about the care of individual patients. This was an important new development because before this time, decisions about patient care were often made based on expert opinion and simply because that's the way things had always been done. Instead, evidence-based medicine recognizes that decisions should be made based on current research and that what we know evolves over time as we build on previous research. This is essential to ensuring that patient care is safe and effective. Evidence-based medicine is a process that involves five steps. It is an iterative process, meaning that it does not necessarily flow in a straight line. The first step is to figure out what you want to know and ask it clearly so that you can then move on to step two, which is where you search for evidence that answers the question. Searching may lead you to change or refine your question. Once you have found the evidence, you move on to step three, where you evaluate the quality and relevance of what you found, and this may lead to changes in your searching. During steps four and five, you use the evidence to inform your decisions about patient care and then evaluate the whole process and find ways to improve next time. Your patient is always at the center of this process. Evidence-based medicine was designed to answer medical questions about the effectiveness of treatments and tests. And for this reason, it tends to value quantitative evidence, such as randomized control trials and meta-analyses more than qualitative evidence. In disciplines outside of medicine, where questions of meaning are important, this poses a difficulty because qualitative evidence is best to answer those types of questions. Evidence-based practice follows the same five steps that were developed for evidence-based medicine, but we're applying this process outside of medicine in other disciplines, such as nursing, social work, dietetics, physical and occupational therapy, and others. Evidence-based practice can also be used outside of the clinical context, such as for making decisions in healthcare management and public policy, and is even used outside of healthcare, for example, by librarians. An important change from evidence-based medicine is that evidence-based practice recognizes the value of qualitative evidence for answering questions about meaning. You may also hear people refer to evidence-informed practice. This is often used interchangeably with evidence-based practice and once again uses the same five steps. Some people prefer to use the word informed because they believe it indicates that the process is more person-centered and is more flexible about what evidence is considered valuable and how it is used to support decision-making. Evidence-based practice can be difficult to implement, and this 2009 study shows some of the most important challenges that nurses in particular may face. 
Some of these challenges occur at the individual level, such as lack of awareness, skills, and time. And some of them occur at the organizational level, such as lack of authority or not enough support from staff and physicians. As we've seen, both evidence-based practice and evidence-informed practice are more inclusive in what kind of evidence is considered of value, but they both still use the five-step model. And the five steps were not created with nursing practice in mind, where the development and implementation of policies and procedures and continuous quality improvement are just as important as decisions about individual patients. The five-step process also does not recognize that evidence-based practice does not just occur at the individual level, but must also be adopted and integrated at the organizational level. Barriers to evidence-based practice, such as what we saw on the previous slide, are also not recognized or addressed. The seven-step evidence-based practice model was developed in order to solve some of these problems. This process was designed specifically by and for nurses, and it includes the aspect of continuous quality improvement that is so important to nursing practice. This model also recognizes the importance of the role of the nurse leader in addressing the barriers to evidence-based practice and creating a culture of evidence where curiosity is encouraged. Here, circled in orange, you can see the two steps that are unique to this model. We still have the original five steps of evidence-based medicine and evidence-based practice, but now we have step zero and step six as well. Let's take a closer look at what's new. Step zero is where we are right now. This video is part of step zero. This new step recognizes the importance of fostering curiosity and creating a culture of evidence within the organization so that nurses feel supported and some of the barriers to adopting evidence-based practice are removed. In step six, we go beyond integrating evidence into practice and evaluating our own process to sharing the results of a more formal evaluation in order to improve practice for others. And this is where continuous quality improvement comes in. So what role does curiosity play? Well, these are some questions that may, you might want to ask yourself. You can watch um, the other videos on this module to learn a little bit more about what is curiosity. You can read some of the books about curiosity. And you can take the test to see what kind of curiosity you have because not everyone has the same kind of curious. But in any case, as you go about your daily life, you may want to think about what is curiosity and, and how does it relate to evidence-informed practice? What might help you become more curious? What would stop you from being curious? How can you just be open to being curious in your daily life, either as a learner uh, or even just as a human being. And think about how curiosity helps us get comfortable with uncertainty. And maybe also how uncertainty might help inspire you to become more curious. Regardless of whether you practice evidence-based medicine, evidence-informed practice, or evidence-based practice, it's important to find the best evidence to answer your question. What kind of evidence is best to answer your question depends on what kind of question you're asking. Generally, questions can be divided into background questions and foreground questions. Here is an example of each. As you can see, background questions are more general in nature, and foreground questions are more specific and relate to the patient for whom you are making a decision.
This pyramid shows the different types of evidence you might find. To answer foreground questions, you'll want to start at the bottom of the pyramid, which also includes textbooks. To answer foreground questions, it's best to start at the top and make your way down until you have found evidence to answer your question. You can use this interactive pyramid to begin your search for best evidence to support your practice. It's also important to remember that you are looking for the best evidence available. Sometimes the answer is that there is no evidence available to answer a particular question because it has not yet been researched. Doing your due diligence and searching for best evidence helps ensure that you did not miss something important. Learn more about the best evidence to answer different types of questions by completing the Ask module. And learn more about the Evidence Pyramid and what you will find at each level by completing the Evidence Pyramid module. Whether you call it evidence-based medicine, evidence-informed practice, or evidence-based practice, and whether you use a five-step, seven-step, or other model, best evidence is only part of the picture. It's equally important to include clinical expertise and judgment in your decision making. Making sure to respect and include the values of your patients is essential. Imagining a three-legged stool is helpful because you need all three legs in order for the stool not to fall down. If you need help on this curious adventure, register for a library clinic, book an appointment with your liaison librarian. Now you can do both from the nursing subject guide, a specific course guide, or the modules, but be sure to complete all the modules before making an appointment because you may find that your questions have been answered.